Tonight we will continue studying verse by verse through the book of Revelation in our series titled Racing to Revelation as we resume our study from last week and observe the amazing prophetic reality of the new Jerusalem, our future heavenly home. And so let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. At the beginning of the book of Revelation, we read this. Blessed is he that reads, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And it has been a blessing to read, and it has been a blessing to hear, and to take the, to heart the truth of the book of Revelation. The Revelation of Jesus Christ. For in this prophetic book, we have not only observed the amazing and awesome eschatological or future events that will certainly come to pass, but we have observed our Savior and our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain in his first coming to provide redemption for sinners, but also the lying of the tribe of Judah who will come again to rescue Israel, to judge the world, to reward the faithful, and to regain all that the first Adam lost through sin. And beginning in Revelation 21, we get a glimpse of, into the eternal state, beginning with the new heaven and the new earth. Verse 1 reads, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven... And the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. And the word new again is the Greek word kainos, which speaks of new and kind or quality, that which is fresh. Unlike this present evil world, the new Jerusalem, I should say the new heavens and the new earth, will be a place dominated by righteousness in every respect. Chronologically, we've seen, again, God's plan for the ages. What is he doing right now? He is building his church, which he will then rapture and then will reward and then eventually bring back to the earth. But prior to that will be the tribulation period lasting seven years. The Lord Jesus will return with the church and defeat the armies of the world at the Battle of Armageddon. There will be the resurrection of tribulation martyrs at that time, along with the resurrection of the Old Testament saints at that time. And there will be a 75-day interval and transition of government as Jesus Christ sets up his millennial kingdom. At the end of that kingdom, while Satan is bound during that thousand years, he is again loose. There is a final revolt in which he, he uh, is able to seduce and lead, as it were, the unsaved who populated the earth during that time and did not trust in Christ. And he forms them into an army. They march on the beloved city, and they are defeated from fire out of heaven. After that, we know is the great white throne judgment in which the unsaved, are stand before the Lord and are cast, as it were, forever into the lake of fire, where Satan and his angels are cast, and where the false prophet and the beast were cast a thousand years earlier. Why? Because their name was not written in the book of life. And now in Revelation chapters 21 and 22, we are looking at the new heavens and earth and the new Jerusalem as we consider here the eternal state. Now, the new heaven and new earth is mentioned in verse 1, but the focus of this chapter and the next is really about the new Jerusalem. And we pick it up in chapter 21 and verse 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, 
The tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his God. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Now as we consider the new Jerusalem here, we're going to at first get a general description of it and some of the elements involved. And then we will see as this chapter rolls on in the beginning of the next, we will get many details filled in beyond what we read in verses 2 through 8. First, we noted last time five various features regarding this new Jerusalem. Number one, its name is the New Jerusalem in contrast to the old. The New Jerusalem in contrast to the old. Verse 1, then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. And again, the Greek word is kainos, new in kind and quality. Number two, we noted its nature, is that it is holy in contrast to chapter 11, verse 8, where Jerusalem is referred to as Sodom, spiritually speaking. It is a holy city, fully set apart unto God and without sin with moral perfection, unlike Jerusalem today. Thirdly, we noted its description is that of a city, with all that a city involves, people, places, things, activities, associations, etc. And though it is not the eternal state in its entirety, the new Jerusalem is the capital city of the eternal state. Number four, we noted its descent is out of heaven from God. We see in verse 2, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from where? Out of heaven from who? From God. This is a city whose builder and maker is God himself and descends out of heaven from God. The fifth feature we noted is, this, is its preparation. And as it relates to its preparation, it was in the past, with the results continuing in the present. That's what the perfect tense mean, as a bride adorned for her husband. You see, the new Jerusalem was prepared previous to it coming down from God out of heaven and is fully prepared when it arrives upon the earth. And that's why verse 2 says, then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And the word prepared here is the Greek word hetoimazo. And it means to prepare, but it's in the perfect tense, which speaks of a completed action in the past with the results continuing. Secondly, it's in the passive voice. This means it didn't prepare itself. Someone prepared it. This city did not prepare itself. It was prepared by another. And it was like a bride adorned for her husband. So who prepared this, this bride? Who prepared this city? It's my studied conviction that the person who prepared the new Jerusalem was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. For what did he exp explicitly explain to his disciples in John 14? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Exact same Greek word. But here it's an infinitive of purpose. It tells us why he left. He went to to prepare a place, not a state, but a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, exact same Greek word again, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And again, it's the same bridal motif as we see in Revelation 21. 
Now, this is different, we note it, than Revelation 19, 7 and 8 where it says, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. We see here Revelation 19 is a bride. Revelation 21 is a place. Revelation 19, the wife prepares herself. Revelation 21, the city is prepared like a bride by another. And I pointed out last time, but I want to mention this again. That eternal life begins the moment an individual places their faith in Jesus Christ and alone who died for their sins and rose again. They have eternal life. Now, where will eternal life be enjoyed, though? Well, he, they have it the moment they believe, according to John 5, 24. It's in, enjoyed, in a sense, right now, as eternal life means you have an eternal relationship with God who's the ultimate author of life. And it's enjoyed right now. But then absent from the body will mean present with the Lord unless the Lord comes. And then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So it's, en- it's obtained on earth. It's enjoyed in heaven. And as we enjoy it in heaven, and I'll touch on where we live in the kingdom in a little bit, we we see that it's going to be enjoyed in this new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem coming down. Now, just like eternal life happens at a point in time when you trust in Christ, but is enjoyed in various places, as it were, the same is true about eternal death. Eternal death happens at a point in time. What point of time is that? When you die physically. Because you're already dead spiritually, and if you don't trust in Christ, you don't have eternal life, so you begin eternal death. Where is eternal death experienced, though? I won't say enjoyed, but experienced. It is experienced in Hades. But it's not... It doesn't end there because Hades eventually is thrown into the lake of fire as is everyone whose name is not written in the book of life. So again, eternal death begins at a point in time, but where it is experienced, the place changes. And you see, apart from reading the Bible and studying that, you just kind of think you die and it's over and people go to heaven, people go to hell. They don't understand many of these details that are sitting there right on the pages of Scripture, but it requires that you read it and you study it and you compare Scripture with Scripture and come to accurate conclusions. Now, I want to raise this question. What might have been true of the New Jerusalem during the Millennial Kingdom? If the New Jerusalem is the place that Christ has prepared, if it is where believers go upon death, the church goes upon death, If our citizenship is in heaven, if we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings, if we've then been risen with Christ, could it be that during the kingdom on earth that the new Jerusalem is hovering or suspended over the earth, is our heaven and is our place that we live in, but we access the earth to serve the Lord in various capacities based upon our reward? You know, otherwise, did the church age saints only enjoy the prepared place, in some cases, if they were raptured, for maybe only seven years? What happened to the prepared place during the millennial kingdom? Was it vacated? Isn't our citizenship in heaven? Isn't this our heaven? And isn't the church the bride of Christ? Now, dispensationalists have been divided on this issue. There is not much scripture There's only inferences, so keep studying and be gracious. And frankly, I'm prone to think this is a good possibility here. But if someone disagrees, like J.B. Hickson does, I've I've tried to interact with them. We haven't been able to connect. Can I use a line from J.B.? One day J.B. will realize that me and Jesus had it right. I stole that from him. 
But our general description of the New Jerusalem now shifts from its various features to its supreme reality. Now capture the impact of verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. You see, the focal point of the New Jerusalem is the reality that the tabernacle of God is with men. And the word tabernacle is the Greek word skene. It speaks of the tabernacle, the tent, the dwelling place of his presence. It's like the tabernacle in the Old Testament was the place that the omnipresent God localized his presence. Like the temple in the Old Testament where the omnipresent God localized his presence in order to fellowship with his people. It's like the Lord Jesus Christ in his incarnation where the omnipresent God localized his presence in a human body. So the scripture says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt, skanao, same word among us. You see, this new Jerusalem is the dwelling place of God's personal presence with men. And there's a five-fold repetition of that thought right here. Notice the tabernacle of God is with men, number one. He will dwell with them, number two. They shall be his people, number three. God himself will be with them, number four, and be their God, number five. What a blessing to the saved. To look forward to to this reality. But what should this remind you of? It should remind you that time and eternity are really about God, not you. The first thing we really see emphasized here in the New Jerusalem and the eternal state is God. God. And that's why Paul said in Philippians 1.21, even today, for to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. As I said before, so many believers are caught up with the spiritual version of the song, You're so vain. You probably think this life is about you. You see, the carnal mind is enmity with God, and in doing so, self is on the throne. You know, you ask the carnal mind, how are you doing? In reality, I'm doing everyone I can, and if they're not looking, I'm doing them twice. That's how the flesh operates. And that's why even as you think of the truth of the broad road and the narrow road, the broad road that leads to hell, we know, again, according to Romans, there are three lanes on that broad road. There's an immoral lane, there is a moral lane, and there's a religious lane. And before someone is saved, they may be a lane changer. It doesn't matter. It ends up at the same destiny, namely hell. And before you're saved as an immoral person, you might be living for the buck. You might be living for sex. You might be living for things. And you might clean up your act and say, you know, I'm going to get moral here. So now you just live for your own pride. Or maybe even to get religious and you try to impress God and impress others. But it's all emanating from the flesh and all your righteousness are as filthy rags and your iniquities like the wind have taken you away. But one day you hear the gospel. One day you hear the good news that Jesus Christ came and Jesus Christ died for your sins, past, present, and future. And that he rose again the third day and that he now offers to you as a gift eternal life. And that it's not a matter of cleaning up your act or repenting of your sins or changing a lane. No, it's a matter in simple faith for you to put your trust in Jesus Christ. To believe that on that cross he died for you. That God who had become a man paid for your sins. And he rose again to save you by God's grace. And the moment you put your faith in Christ, you come through the door and Jesus said, I am the door by me. If any man entering, he shall be saved. 
And now you have eternal life. Your destiny is guaranteed. You are going to heaven. You know beyond the shadow of a doubt for the first time in your life that you're going to heaven, though you know you deserve hell. And now as a believer, God wants to mature you from being a babe in Christ to an adolescent in Christ to being a mature believer in Christ. He wants to have fellowship with you every day. He has a plan for your life. He wants you to fulfill the will of God and to glorify the Savior. But you see, only as you're walking by means of the Spirit in fellowship with the Lord does this transpire because you could also still live a carnal life. And while indeed the carnal believer ends up in heaven, just like the spiritual believer does, the carnal believer operating under human viewpoint with self also still on the throne and operating out of his flesh lives for the very same kind of things they did before they were saved or like unbelievers. They live again for a buck. They live for sex. They live for things. They live for pride. They're out to impress people. And on and on we could go. They fit in the Lord when it's convenient and they are miserable believers. You know why? Because according to the book of Ecclesiastes, apart from a right vertical relationship with God, man is miserable and life is meaningless. And when you're out of fellowship, you prove it. You're wandering around like a cat chasing its tail. And you are miserable. In fact, you're so miserable sometimes you don't even know how miserable you are. Until you find the joy of the Lord and you look back, man, was I miserable. Go running down one dead end street after another. You know why? Because self was on the throne. And instead of reckoning yourself to be dead to the sin nature and alive to God and yielding to the Lord in light of his mercies to do his will and walk by faith and fellowship with him, you're just yielding to your flesh and doing your own thing. Now, you may not be overtly laying one on the town. It doesn't matter. Unbelievers don't overtly always lay them on the town. You're still operating out of your flesh, doing your own thing. And you are miserable. And secondly, you are aimless. You are aimless. In fact, put a marker here and go with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. I want to show you something here about aimless. Verse 17. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Now notice the time. God gives you just this much the time. You're to redeem that time. It may be months, it may be weeks, it may be years. But compared to eternity, it's just a small slot of time. That's all you have, the time. And notice the time of your stay, your sojourning. You're just a pilgrim here. You're just passing through here, and you're to live it in fear. Now, by fear, it means a respect for the Lord. You take God and his word seriously. You wake up in the morning, you take it seriously. This isn't a day for you to waste. This is a day for you to redeem for Jesus Christ. And why are we to live this way? Verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct. Aimless. The unbeliever is aimless. Oh, no, he's running down all kinds of dead-end streets. But they're aimless. Of no eternal value. And when you're carnal, you can live the same way. You're just aimless. Running down dead-end streets too. Because remember, who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes? Solomon, he was a believer. God has redeemed you from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. And what did he do to do that? He redeemed you with the precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Do you remember the price that was paid to redeem you? the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And the word blood isn't speaking of his literal physical blood as if getting nicked during shaving could somehow redeem you. 
The blood is a reference to his violent death where upon that cross he died both spiritually and physically to pay for your sin. There's no one who's ever loved you like that. There's no one who's ever paid a price like that for you to redeem you out of the slave market of sin. And that very Christ has a plan and a purpose for your life now. And it's not to be miserable, but to walk in fellowship with him. It's not to be aimless. It's to fulfill his objectives. It's not to be indulgent, for we read in verse 16, be holy, for I am holy. And it's not about you. It's not about you. And I say that because, again, when you're carnal, it's all about you. You're wrapped up with you. You're wrapped up with your objectives and your plan and your designs instead of, Lord, Lord, what is your will in this? Lord, I yield myself to you. Lord, I want to do your will versus I'm doing this. Oh, by the way, God, can you bless my plans today? And it's a big difference between the two. The one fits the Lord in when it's convenient to attain his objectives versus seeking to serve the Lord on his terms to do his will. You know, it's like the guy before he's saved, he's the karaoke singer there at the bar, you know, and he's showing everyone what kind of voice he's got. And after he gets saved, if he's not walking with the Lord, he is the gospel singer at the front of the church. But it's still all about him instead of about Jesus Christ. And you see, what we realize in this passage as we go back to Revelation 21 is, again, the supreme reality and the focal point of the New Jerusalem is the reality that the tabernacle of God is with men. We also see stressed in this verse the fellowship that God and believers will enjoy forever is stressed by the promises he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Notice it's relational. And what a blessing for the redeemed that we're going to be in the presence of God and we're going to be enjoying fellowship with God. What a blessing. And we're going to behold him, and we're going to be worshiping him, and we're going to be glorifying him, and we're going to be enjoying fellowship with him. So why not start right now? Why not start right now worshiping him? Why not start right now fellowshipping with him? Why not start right now glorifying him? You see, for the ultimate purpose of your existence and mine is to glorify God and enjoy fellowship with him forever. You see, creation was designed to glorify God. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. The angels were designed to glorify God and sing His praises and do His will. And the same is true with you and me. You see, even His redeeming us, His accepting us in the Beloved was to the praise of the glory of God. Of his grace. And thus God wants to show his grace to us. And in doing so he wants to glorify himself. Not because he's some egomaniac. But because he is truly worthy of that praise and honor and glory. And he wants to enjoy fellowship with you. Was that not true in the Garden of Eden? Did he not create Adam and Eve with the capacity to have a personal fellowship with them, which they enjoyed as he walked with them in the cool of the garden? He did not want a robot, and that's why he gave a test. The tree in the middle of the garden, you may not eat. For the day you eat, you shall die. He did not want a robot. He wanted a relationship. And man is not a robot yet today, but still has mentality and volition, though affected by sin. And I say this because, you know, the view of the Calvinist, who takes total depravity to mean total inability to even believe, has man now as a robot. He can't even make a choice to believe. 
unless God regenerates him and gives him the gift of faith, so called. What kind of a God holds people responsible for their unbelief but doesn't give them the gift of faith? Quote. Unbelievable. In fact, just imagine if you had a 10-year-old son and you brought him out to the car and you open up the hood and you say, you know, there's a serious problem with the motor here. I want you to, I want you to redo the motor. And if you don't, you're going to experience severe punishment the rest of your life. What would you say? Unfair! Unfair! Well, can you imagine a God who says, if you don't put your faith in Jesus Christ, you'll be damned forever, and you, but you're not able to believe, and I'm not giving you the gift unless you're one of my elect. But I'm holding you responsible for it. You know what I would yell? Unfair! What kind of God is this? What kind of monster do we have here? And thus, I believe the... God of the Calvinists, the extreme Calvinists, if you want to call him that, has God as a monster who imposes his will upon you. When I see right from the beginning, he wanted a love relationship involving volition. And he wants fellowship with us. J. Dwight Pentecost says, and I quote, this habitation, the New Jerusalem, which will be prepared by the bridegroom for his bride, is a place which will be characterized by the glory of God. In that place, those redeemed by the blood of the Lamb manifest the glory of God, and both the inhabitants and the habitation will become that by which God brings glory to himself throughout the ages of our Lord's reign and the unending ages of eternity. As much as the scriptures has to say concerning our glorification in Christ, the word of God puts primary emphasis on that glory which will come to him when we are translated into his presence. The hymn writer has put it this way. The bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze at glory but on my king of grace. Not at the crown he giveth, but on his pierced hand. The lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's lamb. Do you realize the reason you're breathing air today isn't to do your own thing, it's to glorify the Lord? Is that what you were thinking when you got up in the morning? Is that what you've been thinking when you've been going through this trial? I just want the Lord to be glorified. Is that how you're thinking when you're used of the Lord by his grace? So you're careful not to take the credit, but to give it to him. You see, it's all about his glory. And that is why in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31, what do we read? For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of Duluth, Minnesota, of the world, to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Why did he do it this way? that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, quote, Old Testament, he who glories, let him glory where? In the Lord. Are you glorying in the Lord today? You know, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. He gets the glory, we get the benefits. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21 Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will. Now to do that, he's working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. 
Amen. How about 1 Peter 4.11? If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability or strength which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified, not merely with the results, but with the means. Through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And that's why in Revelation 5, what have we seen in our past studies? They're, they're worshiping the Lamb and the Father in this tremendous scene of worship. You see, this life is not about you and eternity won't be either. But that doesn't mean God doesn't care about you. He does. That doesn't mean he doesn't want to save you. He does. That doesn't mean he doesn't want your fellowship. He does. But it's always about him ultimately and bringing glory to him because he is worthy of it and we are total products of his grace. But as we think of the new Jerusalem, it doesn't end with who is there, namely God, but also what is not there. And as we go back to Revelation 21, we read in verse 4, what is not there? And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Now we see in verse 4 the excluded conditions of the New Jerusalem. What is excluded from it? And in the eternal state, the new Jerusalem, God promises to believers there will be no more tears. No more tears. This reminds us that our God is a great God of compassion and detail. For God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Can you imagine the sheer number of buckets of tears cried down through the centuries? There is a lot of tears that are tears of grief. But there are no, there's no grief in heaven. There are tears that are tears of disappointment. But there's no disappointment in heaven. There are tears of sorrow, but there's no sorrow in heaven. You may have had tears due to a wayward child, due to a disabled child, due to an unfaithful mate, due to some sin committed and you greatly regret having done it. But there's no tears in heaven. And does God know every tear you shed? Do you know the psalmist reminds us in Psalm 56, 8, you in reference to the Lord, number of my wanderings, you put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? This is poetic imagery about how God captures every tear and has compassion. Now notice he doesn't eliminate all tears during this time. He doesn't eliminate those things that cause the tears until this time. And some folks have shed many bottles of tears. But one day, one day, God will wipe away every tear. What a blessing for the redeemed. Secondly, we see in the New Jerusalem, there will be no more death. Verse 4, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death. Now we know from 1 Corinthians 15, 26 that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And we know right in chapter 20 of Revelation, verse 14, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. And thus in the eternal state, you're no longer capable of sin in heaven in a glorified state, and there's no more sin permitted in the eternal state. Where did death begin? Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man, namely Adam, sin entered the world, and death by sin. And just think in time how much death has happened of natural causes or due to wars and famines. 
Just think of the millions Hitler killed and the even more millions Stalin killed. You think of so many babies that have been aborted in the United States. You think of some who have died quickly and some who have very drawn out deaths. Some who have died with mercy, some without mercy as it were. But one day, one day there shall be no more death. In time, even just think of the tribulation, the literally billions of people as three quarters of the earth dies. But one day there shall be no more death in the new Jerusalem, our heavenly home. What a blessing to know that one day there will be no more death. There will be no obituaries in the paper in heaven. There will be no single funeral to attend in heaven. There will be many ways to serve the Lord in heaven, but one will not be a mortician. The hearse will have made its last journey. But we're not done yet. For in the eternal state in the new Jerusalem, God promises to believers that there will be no more sorrow. No more sorrow. That which is usually connected with tears and death is sorrow. And don't let the agnostic college philosophy teacher trip you up when he or she asks, if God is good, why is there suffering in the world? Why is there suffering in the world? Well, number one, because of Adam's sin and the curse. Adam's sin and the curse. And as a result of Adam's sin, death and decay and disease began with all the suffering connected with that. So that God would say in the Garden of Eden after Adam's sin, dust thou art and dust thou shalt return. Secondly, it's due to sinners. And by virtue of the fact that there are sinners in the human race, and sinners sin, just like dogs bark. Sinners violate other sinners. They're lied to, abused, disobeyed, cursed, slandered, robbed, raped, murdered, etc. But for God to eliminate all sin means he'd have to eliminate all sinners. And he hasn't chosen to do that yet. Thirdly, it's because of Satan, the archenemy of God who with one-third of the angels rebel against God and who loves to destroy human lives, loves to destroy marriages, loves to destroy families, who is in his diabolical plan is seeking to conquer the world again through the Antichrist. And we know that Satan was the cause behind the suffering that righteous Job experienced. And he's behind much suffering in our world as well. But fourthly, there's suffering in the world due to suffering for Christ. And it's actually the world that's causing the suffering. For all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And fifthly, we know that God allows so suffering in his sovereignty. He's in control, though he doesn't condone it. And we know as Joseph said in Genesis 50, verse 20, even though they meant it for evil, God still means it for good. As we think of suffering, I'm reminded of Romans 8, 18. For I reckon that the sufferings, and there are many, plural, of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And you see that word reckon right there? The word reckon means that I calculate up the facts and come to this conclusion. And it's nothing to do with what I feel like. It has to do with the truth of the word of God, which I have taken by faith, so that by faith I reckon, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. You compare the Sufferings of this present time, they're not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And that's why Sean taught last Sunday 
how in this great salvation you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness or trying of your faith be much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be, though it be tried with fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory, the revelation of Jesus Christ. First Peter 1, 6 and 7. Now, when we think of suffering, remember, there's two kinds, though. There's deserved and undeserved. The deserved, you can live without. The undeserved, you don't really have a choice in. When it comes to deserved, Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Deserved suffering means you reap What you have sown, you do not sow a carnal seed and reap a spiritual fruit. Undeserved suffering is what Paul experienced, the thorn in the flesh. It wasn't because he was sinning, it was actually because he was righteous. But God wanted to keep him humble and dependent. With deserved suffering, you reap what you have sown. With undeserved, you experience hardship you have not sown. Deserved suffering is due to your sinful choices and pride. Undeserved suffering is due to God's sovereign choice and providence. Deserved suffering may involve punishment like the unsaved or divine discipline by way of the saved. Where undeserved may be a result of the curse or persecution or God's good purposes. When it comes to deserved suffering as a believer, you need to take responsibility for your choices and confess your sins and learn from this. And divine discipline, dear friend, is a very real thing. You know, when believers go la-la down carnal road and think nothing's going to blow up, think again. This God who loves you, who has redeemed you, whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every side. And scourging doesn't exactly sound like with a feather. Divine discipline is a very real thing. When I see a believer walk out of fellowship with the Lord and just go there, I think, you know what? You're, you're, you're asking for and under divine discipline. Now, God might just let you gag on the world, and he's really gracious. It's like the prodigal son, the father with the prodigal son. He might just let you gag, but sometimes he intervenes and his spankings hurt. Remember, if they don't hurt, you don't learn from them. On the other hand, As a believer, you need to walk by faith in the Lord, even if you don't understand why, and learn through your undeserved suffering. You know, there are some believers who think everything's just a trial. They don't even stop and ask, well, maybe I brought this on myself. Is this divine discipline? And then there are other believers who are always thinking, this must be divine discipline. Oh, no, maybe it's just a trial. Both options are on the table, and if you don't know, either way you have to turn to the Lord. Does he have your attention now? And what a blessing to know that there will be no more suffering one day for the redeemed, both deserved and undeserved. Fourthly, in the eternal state in the New Jerusalem, God promises to believers that there will be no more crying. And some men are already there, it seems. No more crying. Crying over the loss of a child or crying over the destiny of the lost or the carnality of the saved. Maybe crying due to physical abuse or sexual abuse. And dear child of God, what a blessing to know that one day there will be no more crying. No more crying. And fifthly, no more pain. No more pain. God says it and he doesn't stutter. There shall be no more pain. Pain due to whatever. Maybe due to cancer. In fact, you know that little booklet, What Cancer Cannot Do? I just keep hearing story after story how God uses it in the heart of the saved and the unsaved. If you don't have a copy, you can pick one up. And you know, all the above, tears, death, sorrow, crying, and pain are due to Adam's sin and the curse, though there can be other factors involved as well. What a blessing. Remember, blessed is he who reads 
He who hears and takes to heart these things. What a blessing to know that one day there will be no more pain. Now that's not true of those in hell. That's true only of those in the new Jerusalem in heaven. And if the new Jerusalem is the place Christ went to prepare for us, and I believe it is, and if we already have eternal life and we do, does it not stand to reason that all of these realities will be enjoyed and experienced in heaven upon death? If this is what the new Jerusalem is like? And that is why I don't hesitate to read to someone who's saved and dying, or even at a funeral, this very passage, because I believe for that believer they have eternal life. And in at least some sense, the eternal state has already begun for them. And they're going to go to heaven where they're going to enjoy the new Jerusalem. And therefore, they're going to enjoy all these things, though the new Jerusalem hasn't come down out of heaven from God yet at this point. But that's my rationale behind it. And when the Bible says that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, there shall no, be no more pain, why is this going to be the case? Why? For the former things have passed away. The word for is the Greek word hati, which means because. The former things have passed away, just like what was true regarding the new heavens and new earth. The former things have passed away. Dear saints, no more snow. No more snow. And so as we consider the new Jerusalem, we've seen its various features. We've seen its supreme reality. We've seen its excluded conditions. And now we see, as it were, a summary statement about what we've just read. Verse 5, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new, kainos, new in kind and quality. And he said to me, write, John, for these things are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Now in this summary statement, verse, this verse, in, in verse 5, this is the first explicit statement recorded from God the Father since chapter 1, verse 8, when he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Notice the similarities in chapter 21 to verse 1. Chapter 1, keep that in mind. And where is God located and what does this underscore? Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And to sit on the throne speaks of his sovereignty. His sovereignty. He is in charge. He is the king. He is the one supreme ruler of the universe. And his dogmatic statement is simply, Behold, I make all things new. And he doesn't need your help. I make all things new. Similar in language to Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. There's coming a day when it comes to the new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem that, cry, that the Lord says, I make all things new. Now, can you trust these words? Will there really be a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem? Will there really be no more tears and death and sorrow and crying and pain one day in the new Jerusalem? Can you trust these words? What does he say? Write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. Just like God is trustworthy and true. And that is why, dear friends, when you read the word and you rightly divide it, you can know that it will come to pass for these words are trustworthy and true. You know, you can't absolutely say that of any human being. But you can say that of God. Now, in a relative sense, you might say he's trustworthy and he's true, but only relatively. But not absolutely. But when it comes to God's word, it is trustworthy and true in an absolute sense. 
So will this promise one day be fully accomplished? What does he say? Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. It's accomplished. It's completed. It is done, just as God said it would be. He made all things new. Boom, it happened. Now, verse 6 goes on to say, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Now, notice his self-description. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. If you know the Greek alphabet, you know the first letter of the alphabet is the Alpha. Alpha. You know, the last letter is the omega. The beginning and the end. What is he saying here? In the beginning there is God, at the end there is God. And this, by the way, is also a description of the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation 1, 17 and 18. I am the first and the last. I am he that was dead and is alive forevermore. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. But notice again the connections back to chapter 1 in this chapter. It's similar to what Paul wrote in Romans eleven thirty six, For of him, the word of here is the Greek word ek. In other words, out from him as a source or an origin, and through him, Greek word dia, through by way of means, and to him, ice by way of goal, are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. From the Lord, through the Lord, and to the Lord are all things. In other words, it's not about you. It's about him. And yet you graciously receive the benefits of his love and of the work of his son, if you're willing to put your trust in him. So in observing the new Jerusalem, we've seen its various features, its supreme reality, its excluded conditions, and its summary statement. And next, but not least, important, we observe its occupants. Who's going to be there? And who's not going to be there? Now, I find it interesting before that is definitively given to us, we see, first of all, an inclusive offer of God. And what does he say at the end of verse 6? I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Notice, it's inclusive. It's an offer given to anyone, to everyone, to whosoever. Are you thirsty? God has something to offer you. No one is left out of this offer. And what is the offer about? First of all, it's about the water of life. The water of life. Water is necessary for life. The water which is life, eternal life. You know, this reminds me distinctly of what John wrote in John 4. From the lips of the Lord Jesus. You remember what he said to that woman at the well? Who came with her bucket to gather physical water. And Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water in this well will thirst. Notice the word thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him. A well of water springing up to eternal life. Same idea. Notice the word thirst is used here as well. You come to physical water and you know what? You're going to thirst again. And by the way, you come to a church and you come to a ritual and you come to a set of good works to get you to heaven and you're still going to be thirsty. Because none of those things can give you a relationship with God. You're going to still be thirsting for eternal life. And the word drinks here is interesting. It's in the present tense. Everyone who drinks keeps on drinking of this water, will thirst again, but whatever drinks, this is in the aorist tense. 
One drink quenches forever. And if you drink of the water, I will give him that only Jesus Christ can give you. You're going to never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Notice the imagery is similar of what we're reading here. Notice how believing is as simple as drinking water. You make a commitment. Oh, I commit myself to you. I surrender. I submit. I'm making you water Lord of my life. No. You just drink it. It's just simple as drinking water. And the same is true with getting saved. It's as simply as putting your faith in Jesus Christ. So notice it's the water of life. Second thing you want to notice here is it's freely. It's the Greek word dorion. Dorian speaks of something freely. Now catch this. Without cost to you and without cause in you. Something that is free costs you nothing and it's not given because there's something going on with you. It's because of the giver. Now where else is this word Dorian found? Well, it's found in... Where did that go, that verse? <laughs> It's found in Romans 3, verse 24. We're justified, how? Freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Same word, freely. Why does it cost you nothing? Because it is paid in full by the Lord Jesus on the cross. Notice also, I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who, what? Thirsts. A description of the unsaved. Thirsting for a relationship with God. In need of water. The water of eternal life. And I'll tell you this. You can go down a lot of dead end streets and be still thirsty. You can go down... The, you can drink the water of relationships and you're going to end up thirsty. You can drink the water of drug addiction and you're going to end up thirsty. You can drink the water of alcohol and you're going to end up thirsty. You're not going to find what your soul needs there. You're going to be a thirst until you take the water of life which is offered to you freely. So if you need the water of life and it's offered to you freely because Christ paid for your sins and rose again, how do you receive this gift of God's grace? Well, look at chapter 22 for a minute and verse 17. Well, we'll start in verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the church as I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come! Let him who hears say, Come! Let him who thirsts, Come! Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Now I want you to notice here that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the Bride, who's the Bride? The church. Say what? Come. You know, it's interesting for the word come is a present imperative. The idea is, come right now without delay. Come right now. And it assumes you can come. It didn't say, oh, and by the way, wait for God to give you the gift of faith so that somehow it just kind of washes over you and you might find yourself believing one day. No. No. Come. Come. And let him who hears say, come. You've been reading this book. You've been hearing it. What do you want to say to people? You need to come. Come to Christ. Again, a present imperative. And let him who thirsts, there's that phrase again. What does he need to do? He needs to come at once. Delay no longer. Whoever desires, are you thirsty? Do you desire to get saved? Do you desire eternal life? Do you desire to go to heaven? Let him do one thing. Just take the water of life freely. 
Salvation is as simple as taking a gift. And it's interesting for the word take here is an aorist active of lambano. It carries the idea right here. Choose to take the water of life. There's that phrase again, water of life. And notice it's free, just like we read earlier. You need to come and take. You come to Christ and you take what he offers you. There's that verse I was looking for. You stinker. Okay. Notice what Jesus said in John 6. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst, just like we just read. How do you come? You believe. How do you take? You believe in him. But I said to you, you have seen me in your promise. You do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. He will never cast you out. You do not come to a church as no church can save you. You do not come to a baptismal fountain or baptistry as no ritual can save you. You do not come to the front of the church to say the sinner's prayer. You come by faith to Christ. And you take what he offers you and you take it as a gift and it costs you nothing and it's without cause. And why? Because he loves you and wants to save you and he will at that very moment. So if someone does not go to heaven, is it God's fault? The answer is absolutely no. It's their fault for not responding to the truth of God that they had so as to come to faith in Christ alone as Savior. Stop blaming God for someone's condemnation. It's not due to their lack of divine election. It is not due to their geographical location. It is not due to their upbringing. It is due to their own choice and unbelief. For even at the end of the Bible here in Revelation, the last chapter, we see God still pleading with people to come and take. Something that costs them nothing. And isn't it funny? And I don't remember if I said it here or where I said it. But can you imagine if Walmart tomorrow in Duluth said, come at 9 o'clock and everything you want, you can have, just take it, it's free. People would be intense tonight in the cold. They wouldn't care about the weather report. They'd come and take some earthly material thing that's not worth a dime in light of eternity. But you offer salvation, it's like, well, I don't know if I want that. And so verse 6 begins with this inclusive offer of God. But only some take. Only some come. Only some trust. And so we read in verse 7 that the included occupants of God's eternal home are described as he who overcomes, who has promised that he shall inherit all things, and I will be his God and he shall be my son. And you see the phrase, he who overcomes, is not new to us. We'll see it in a moment. Ho nakao is repeatedly mentioned in chapters 2 and 3. Notice he's going to inherit all things. All these blessings of God's grace included in the new Jerusalem, you're going to inherit. And even better, you're going to be, I will be as God and he shall be my son. Now that is sweet. So this raises the question, who is the overcomer? Now again, you can just jot down these verses due to time. We're told by John, who also wrote Revelation, who the overcomer is. 1 John 5, 4 and 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Not a certain kind of believer, but all believers are overcomers. And that is why in the same chapter, what does he say? These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. For we, you see, if you put your faith in Christ, you share in his victory over the world. 
And that is why Romans 8, 37 says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. We are huper nikao. Through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now go to Revelation 3. You have to move quick. My time is just about gone, and you don't want to miss this. He's writing to the church at Sardis, and I want you to see the promise of verse Five, where again we see this phrase, ho nakao, verse five, he who overcomes. Promise number one, shall be clothed in white garments. Promise number two, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Promise number three, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And that's to the overcomer. And who's the overcomer? He is a believer. What is the promise? He's going to be clothed in white garments. Isn't that true of all believers? And I will not blot his name out of the book of life. His name is in the book of life, never to be blotted out. Isn't that true of all believers? That's eternal security. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So this is in reference not to a certain kind of believer. Now look at Revelation chapter 3 verse 9 where he's writing to the church at Philadelphia because it ties into this. He says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. Now, I want to point out something that's really critical here. And this this verse puzzled me for a long time until I understood something grammatically. That you see, you see the period right there? Now remember, there are no periods in the, in the Greek manuscripts originally. And there's great textual evidence to support the fact the sentence does not end there. Instead, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my commandment to persevere and the period should be right there. And then he also says, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. He's promising them that they won't be here during the time of the tribulation, not because they persevere, but as a gift of his grace. So the first is, in a sense, a reward. The second is, in a sense, a gift. Wow, what a difference a period makes, huh? And what does he say? Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, ho nakao again. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. Now catch this. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. And what is the name of that city? The New Jerusalem. Are we talking about the same city? Yes, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. In other words, while some like to say, well, in chapter 1, 21, the whole nikaos aren't the same as the chapters 2 and 3, think again. They are the exact same people, and the reason they have in their forehead the name of the new Jerusalem is because they are overcomer, and that is where they are going one day. Same description, same blessing. Bad exegesis to interpret it differently. You say, but what about those who are excluded? And there are those excluded. According to Revelation 21 now in verse 8, we read, but in contrast, the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their place in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You see, the excluded individuals from God's eternal home are the unsaved. Oh, they were thirsty, but they did not come. They were thirsty, 
but they did not take of the water of life freely. They were thirsty, but they never shared in Christ's victory. Thus, they did not inherit all things. Instead, they die in their sins due to the rejection of Jesus Christ and remain in their sinful state throughout all eternity as they have their part in the lake of fire, which is the second death. Now, how is this verse usually misunderstood? Well, that sinners who commit these sins or persist in a pattern of these sins will not ultimately go to heaven. You see, the Calvinistic view is if you are described by these sins, you were never, ever saved. The problem with that are myriad. How many times do you have to lie before you're a liar? How many times do you have to be unbelieving before you are unbelieving? How many times do you have to murder before you're a murderer? Oh, I guess more than once. And so forth and so forth. Now, the Arminian view is if you commit these things, you will lose your salvation. And ironically, at the end of the day, the Calvinists and the Arminians agree because if you don't persevere in faithfulness and godliness, you don't make it at the end. One thinks you were never saved, the other thinks you'll lose it, but you got to persevere to ultimately make it. But what says the Scriptures? I ask, can a genuine believer ever commit these sins or a pattern of them? What do you think? Of course. Don't look at me like you don't know. <laughs> How about the cowardly? You know that same Greek word is used of Christ's disciples in Mark 4, verse 40, and they were saved men. How about like the unbelieving? It's used of Thomas in John 20, verse 27. He was a saved man abominable. I didn't have time to find an example there. How about murderers like Moses? How about like sexually immoral people like King David? How about idolaters like kings or sorcerers like King Saul? How about idolaters like King Solomon? How about all liars like everyone? I mean, what does Romans 3, 4 say? Let God be true in every man, a eh? Liar! We're all going to hell then. If that's how you want to interpret this, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And a carnal believer is capable of anything in the catalog of sins, including the same kind of sins as an unbeliever. But we know from John 3, 16 through 18, that what ultimately condemns a person is not their sins, it's their what? Their unbelief, verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So if you don't believe, what does God say is true of you? Jesus said, therefore I said to you that you will die, now catch this, in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Not because of your sins, but in your sins, because you're not clothed with the righteousness of Christ, your sins have never been washed away, so Christ sees you unsaved, unbelieving, still dead in your sins, unforgiven. Though the penalty has been paid. And that's why he said to the Corinthians, and such were some of you, but you were washed you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. In fact, remember I said that we keep seeing these references in 21 back to chapter 1? Do you realize what is the first recorded blessing to believers in chapter 1? That's true of all believers. Revelation 1, 5 and 6. To him who loved us, and what did he do? Washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, if he washed us from our sins and he clothed us with the righteousness of Christ, does he see us any longer in our sins? No. He sees us in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And this is why, as we think of those who are going to be cast into the lake of fire. Do you understand now why we're to personally evangelize? Do you understand why we're to invest in missions? Do you understand why we're to pray for the salvation of others? Do you understand why we equip the saints for their work of ministry? So that people can hear the gospel and be saved 
before it's too late. Because as we think of prepared places, did you realize that Jesus said, he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, which is also prepared. It's been prepared, perfect tense, for the devil and his angels. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. It's not prepared for you. But if you reject Jesus Christ and you die in your sins, unforgiven, you're going to spend eternity there. So I plead with you to come to Christ tonight, to take the water of life freely and know you're saved. Why? Because Jesus Christ died for you and rose again to save you. Put your trust in him. Take that water of life and you can know you are saved. And then you can say, Oh, yes. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. I end with the old black spiritual. Give me Jesus. Oh, when I come to die, oh, when I come to die, oh, when I come to die, Give me Jesus. You may have all the world, but what you have to have is you have to have Jesus Christ. Do you have him tonight? Let's pray.